Welcome everybody, I'm Noi. Welcome to Phoenix Over 40. And today's power principle is the truth about trauma and what it does to our brains and body. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of background on my story. Um, only, geez, five years ago, I was 30 pounds overweight. Um, I was on anti-anxiety medication, Lexapro uh, for numerous threats uh, to my own safety that I was in mental health institutions for since I was ooh, 16. Um, I was diagnosed with Barrett's esophagus, which is a precancerous condition of the esophageal lining um, caused by just um, acid reflux over extended periods of time. Um, it had started to change the chemical consistency of my esophagus, and I had to be put on medication for that, Dexalant. And I had fibromyalgia, a pain in my neck and my traps, in my back, my lower back, my feet felt like walking on firecrackers. Um, they were giving me all kinds of tests. I had MRIs and x-rays and everything you can think of. And the doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong. So of course they label it fibromyalgia, which is what they call it when they don't know what's wrong. Um, I was on hypertension medication. Um, I had high blood pressure, which they just said, well, that's just genetic, no big deal. Um, but my high blood pressure had started to climb to the point where I needed to be medicated. Finally, the kind of deciding factor and the, the linchpin of it all, uh, I went into premenopause at age 38. Uh, my body just stopped producing estrogen. It just quit on me. And of course, all of the different things that happen with that, crazy amounts of muscle loss, um, crazy mood swings, hot flashes, night sweats, just everything started kind of falling down. The, the, the house of cards that I had built around me just started collapsing. And I was finally kind of forced to look at the situation after ruling out everything that could possibly be, you know, seriously physically wrong. We did biopsies of pretty much my entire body. And um, I had to kind of come to terms with the fact that stress was most likely killing me and make some major changes. Um, so I started digging into brain science at that point. And I really, I love brain science. I love to learn about how the brain works, how the body works, how it all works together. And um, so I'm gonna share some of that with you today. And the truth about trauma and what a trauma is. Well, there's two types of traumas to start with. Um, get my slides going here. <laughs> there we go. There's two types of traumas that uh, that are categorized as A and B. So a type A trauma is a trauma that occurs when there is the absence of some sort of basic need that needs to be filled, particularly in childhood. Remember, I always talk about how our brains are forming at a huge rate when we're children, especially under the age of six. And when, um, and that is also the time when our subconscious is forming the most as well. So if we're denied basic needs, such as um, food that we need at the right time, lack of affection, lack of attention, maybe there's an unhealthy, stressful environment in the home, maybe abandonment if one of our parents is emotionally um, or physically just abandons us. Those are type A traumas, things that we needed to be given um, that we weren't given. And those that, that can actually uh, amount to a lot of different things. Um, for me, my specific situation, here's an example. Um, my father, I, I love my father, first of all. This is, this is not a blame game. I never believe in blaming anybody, but I'm gonna give you a little bit of context here. My father um, was raised in an extremely physically abusive home. And because of that, he was never really taught how to be a dad because his dad was not a good dad. And so because of that, he was really emotionally, um, re he emotionally retreated, especially from us kids when we became into our teenage years, because teenage years for him were so you know, tumultuous. He was really just uncomfortable with the whole concept of teenagers. And so he really backed off emotionally and that, that left all of us kids, there's five of us, really feeling kind of emotionally abandoned by him. Um, Many of us still hold a lot of resentment towards him, and um, you know, and 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 it it 
not only that, but I mean, he, he tried his best. I mean, he, he, he tried to create the best situation that he could for us. But because of his emotional traumas, he emotionally withdrew from us. And so that was one example of a basic need that we all needed, affection, attention from our fathers, you know, guidance, communication, all of those things were really pulled away from us as we were growing up. And so um, that was one of the things that I found to be kind of at the root of a lot of my problems. Um, but then the next thing is, type B traumas. So type B traumas are actual specific events that are so emotionally charged that it um, creates havoc on your brain and body. Um, some uh, examples would be physical, sexual, or verbal abuse, um, war, going to war. Naturally, we hear about this one a lot, going to war, bullying, assaults of any kind, maybe a car accident, or even a near-death experience. One example that I can think of from my life is breast cancer, going through breast cancer. I actually went through breast cancer just in 2020, 2021. And um, just that whole experience of having to lose a piece of you that, um, you know, lose a piece of your body and, and your body just rejecting that and having to go through multiple physical surgeries uh, with all of the medication and the recovery and all of that. That's a very traumatic event. And anybody that's ever been through breast cancer surgery or cancer of any kind, the chemo, the radiation, all of that kind of stuff, those can be really traumatic events. Um, but that's an example of a type B trauma. So, you know, although type A traumas are less visible to the human eye and less specific because they aren't specific events, they are actually the ones that cause the worst damage, particularly when they occur during the childhood years. You know, um, type A trauma actually affects the brain's ability to develop um, in, and create a stable and emotional personality and the, able to, uh, the ability to process events correctly. You know, the effects of this type of trauma include um, fearful or aggressive behavior. Um, we have ADHD, which also <laughs> I have. Um, learning disabilities, you know, attachment disorders, guilty of there too, and even physical developmental disabilities because especially if it's in children, I actually have seen a lot of cases. I, I was a minister's wife for 20 years and I ministered to all types of people. And one of the types of flock that I believe God gave me were women in the um, social system that were getting their children taken away from them. And a lot of it was because of traumatic abuse that they dealt with growing up, they couldn't care for their children as a result. And as a result, those children were developing a lot of major problems in their brain development, not, not, um, you know, progressing as they should, you know, and, and it, it was definitely something very obvious that came up that this was just a cycle of trauma. Um, the difference between the two traumas is that type B traumas don't always leave a lasting impact. You know, the, those specific event types traumas, those things that we seem, you know, that we always associate with the word trauma, like a rape or an assault, actually, depending on the strength of a person's emotional and psychological development, particularly early in childhood, um, they don't necessarily deal with, you know, the same types of effects. People can bounce back from, um, type B traumas, as long as their personal capacity to deal with those traumas isn't overloaded. Um, but, but if it is overloaded, because for whatever reason, maybe it's consistent type B traumas, like if you're in a war zone for a long period of time, naturally multiple events kind of compact together, those can definitely start to affect the shape of your brain and start to affect your ability to process and regulate emotion and complex decision making. So um, both of these types of traumas are very serious, but type B traumas tend to be the ones that are easier to heal because they are specific events and most people are able to deal with them as long as they already have a foundation of psychological health to get them through and already laid down. Now, there are three areas of the brain. According to Dr. Paul McLean, who is a renowned neuro, uh, neuroscientist, uh, the brain can be divided into three main parts, the reptilian, 
the mammalian and the neomammalian brain, or what some people call the human brain. Um, the reptilian brain houses our survival instincts and it manages our autonomic body processes. So that's things like blinking. We do those, we do blinking without even thinking or our heart rate, our heart beating, um, breathing, um, hunger, thirst, those basic functions that we often take for granted and just overlook because we know that they're just going to happen. That is your mammalian brain or reptilian brain. Uh, then there's the mammalian brain. The mammalian brain is the brain responsible for processing emotions like joy and fear, and it regulates our attachment style. Then the neomammalian brain is responsible for sensory processing, learning, memory, decision making, and complex problem solving are all part of the human brain or neomammalian brain. Now, when we experience a trauma, the brain actually shuts down all non-essential systems and activates the sympathetic nervous system and the mammalian brain. So your mammalian brain takes over when you are in a traumatic event or situation. Um, this helps us to survive the trauma the, and the brain releases stress hormones. It activates the fight or flight responses. And then after the threat passes, the parasympathetic nervous system reactivates and then all three parts of the brain start functioning again. Now, traumatic stress uh, can change the brain's delicate chemical balance and structure if long periods of time or multiple traumatic events happen to a person. Um, and this can actually affect the way that we function and it can mirror or sever uh, it can, or it can be minor or severe, depending on the type of traumatic stress that it is. So for some people, and they might develop post-traumatic stress disorder. If you've ever heard of this, this is a common term for people that come back from war, where you know they might just be triggered by something and they might lash out as though they were in a wartime situation. Um, but other people, those of us that maybe didn't have a specific giant event like that, we can all just live with a heightened sense of anxiety we can act impulsively, we can have difficulty managing our emotions. All of these are changes and symptoms that occur because of the way traumatic stress affects our brain. So let me explain a little about the areas of our, in our brain that are specifically um, impacted by traumatic stress. First of all, we have the amygdala. So you remember, I love to talk about the amygdala. <laughs> the amygdala is the gatekeeper of our limbic system. The amygdala is literally responsible for helping us judge a situation and process the accurate emotion to go with the situation. The problem with being under traumatic stress or long-term traumatic stress is that the amygdala can get overactivated and um, it can become more easily triggered it and become hypersensitive and it activates many times it activates large emotions when it's not necessarily appropriate to the situation so if your amygdala is being constantly stimulated over and over over a long period of time or it has been stimulated to the to the effect that it actually changes the way that it functions it basically then starts to become a loose gate you know it won't judge a situation necessarily accurately it'll just jump to fear it'll jump to fear and you'll just get this overwhelming anxiety. This was one of the problems that I was having. Um, but it also, another thing that it does is it also activates our negativity bias. So we were created with a negativity bias. Evolution created it in us because we needed to protect ourselves. Um, so we needed to kind of, when we're living in caves and running from saber tooth tigers, we needed to be on guard at all times. So our negativity bias is there to judge a situation and take the more conservative and safe route. Problem is these days we're not being chased by saber tooth tigers. And if our amygdala is not functioning the way it's supposed to, our negativity bias starts to just cloud our vision on everything. Have you ever, you know, been in a, a large room of people and 90% of them are smiling, and then for some reason you just can't stop looking or thinking about the one person who's got a frown on their face? Like, what is wrong with that? Like, what, what didn't they like about me or whatever? Um, or or you, you post something on the internet and you've got all oh, these hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of likes and then one person thumbs down or writes a comment that just doesn't rub you the right way. And, you're, and all you can do is just focus on that one thing. I mean, th this is an example of a negativity bias and we all have it. Um, but some of our negativity biases are more easily triggered and a little more sensitive than others. 
Now, next we have the hippocampus. The hippocampus is an area of the brain that actually is responsible for storing and retrieving our memories. It is also responsible for distinguishing between the past and the present. Um, when we're under tra severe traumatic stress, our hippocampus actually starts to lose mass. It actually starts to shrink. I mean, it's a really big, big organ over here and it starts to shrink. And um, this can actually make it difficult for us to distinguish between the emotional response that we should be having and whether or not it might be triggering something from our past. So for instance, um, you might be in a performance review with your boss and your boss is sitting there and you know, you've done all this great, you know, this has been great, you've been doing great, but if there's any areas that I think that you should improve in, it should be this, this, and this. And then instead, because you have been under traumatic stress or, or suffering from a traumatic stressful event um, due to bullying as a child, your body creates the same response as if you were being, you know, bullied by a bunch of girls on the schoolyard who are calling you names and telling you you're this or that and, and you know, maybe physically intimidating you and you're getting that same, res same res uh, stress response as that past experience because your brain can distinguish between being bullied in the future or present or being bullied in the past. So that's an example of that. And then there is what's called the neo, uh, neo, sorry, prefrontal cortex, neoprefrontal cortex, which is the whole front half of our brain. Um, the midsection of our brain, that's where our habits and our normal everyday subconscious programs lie. But our prefrontal cortex, that's actually responsible for um, just basic uh, impulse control, problem solving, interpreting the emotions of others, uh, regulating our own emotions, reasoning, things like that. I'm going to see a, a lot of examples right here. Um, and being under traumatic stress can actually make logical thinking very difficult. Have you ever been in maybe a fight with your husband or ex-husband or whatever? You've been, been in a fight with somebody and you're having trouble forming your arguments because all of a sudden your brain kind of turns to mush because you can't can't think straight. You're just so emotional. And so that's because your prefrontal cortex stopped. <laughs> it just shut off. And that's what stress does to our prefrontal cortex. And you can actually, if you have, you know, severe stress responses and long-term stress, this whole area starts to actually lose its function. And they found that in several different brain scans uh, neurologists have. So that is one of the major effects uh, that people have to over, you know, overcome when they're, when they're dealing with this. Now, living with traumatic stress can lead to all kinds of things. And um, unfortunately, I was, and I'm a good example of what all of these things are, but we've got anxiety, uh, fatigue, fatigue, as in mental fatigue, as in you just can't even deal with the day. Like you just already just feel tired all the time like physically, but you're also just too tired to even like do your basic self-care routines, that kind of thing. Major anxiety, like all day long, you're just maybe feeling this nervous issue in your stomach or, or you just have this, for me, it's it's kind of like fire on my skin when I when I get these um, anxiety attacks and, and insomnia, having trouble sleeping. I had a major problem. I was on vacation for that too, matter of fact. Um, irritability, just, just being you know, that person that just kind of barks at people all the time. Flashbacks, naturally, if you, especially if you had a specific traumatic event, um, nightmares, having the same thing, um, having to relive those things because your hippocampus is not distinguishing between the past and the present. Panic attacks, I still get those from time to time. Um, they're getting much better though, but I had them a lot um, back in the day. Memory issues, that is definitely something. Learning new skills, if you're not able to use your prefrontal cortex, you're not able to learn new skills can't teach yourself anything uh, if you can't use that part of your brain. Um, poor concentration, struggle with that. That's why ADHD is often um, misdiagnosed in a lot of kids who just are lacking, you know, they're, 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 they're in traumatic homes and it manifests itself as ADHD. He's super anxious and hard time concentrating, hard time sitting still. All of those things could just be, the truth of it is they might just, might just have a really erotic and chaotic home life. Um, attachment disorders, having a problem relating to other people, having a problem diagnosing their their responses to you accurately. So, I mean, you think that they're constantly judging you or 
or, or you have a hard time opening up emotionally to, in, a, in a romantic relationship, you have a time, hard time bonding with other people, that was definitely a problem for me because my father was so emotionally detached. I had a hard time bonding with men because of that. Um, trouble making decisions, naturally, if your brain's prefrontal cortex is not in, you know, in the right state, you can't make good decisions. And uh, communication problems, finding a way to, to accurately advocate for yourself in a situation. Um, even if you're not in that stressful situation, if you're not able to function at your full capacity, just putting your normal thoughts into words becomes very difficult. I had a hard time with this. Um, I'm getting a lot better, obviously, but I had a hard time just basically saying normal thoughts because my brain was not functioning at its normal capacity. Um, and then, you know, naturally, like I said, just difficulty learning new things. It is hard to teach yourself new things and start your life over when you're already being sabotaged by your brain not working all the way. Now, there is hope. Now, this sounds like a lot of like, what's going on? You know, there's so much, so much doom and gloom here. I want to tell you though that there is actually hope, and it all starts with dealing with three things. These are body as a system, and if we deal with all three of these things, there is hope to not only live your life moving forward, released from stress but heal that stress going backwards in your brain and restore your brain to its capacity. Um, and of course, it starts with the physical. First of all, you have to physically remove the stress from your life. For me, um, unfortunately, my 20 year marriage was the stressor. I, my husband, he also had his own mental illness issues. He had OCD and it manifested itself in some very emotionally abusive behavior towards me. Um, and, and then of course he tried to self-medicate with alcohol, which became an addiction. And, you know, he was just addicted. He, he was a mess. And now I can say that because I'm actually really good friends with him, but he was a wreck. And because he was a wreck, I participated in it, but in that situation by protecting him from consequences, I became an enabler because I was trying to protect him. I was trying to save him. I was trying to, to heal our marriage. And I was trying to love us for the both of us. But the truth is he didn't love himself. So he couldn't love me. And I couldn't love both of us for both of us. So, um, you know, that's one of those situations where you're in a traumatic situation long term, you're not getting what you needed. I wasn't getting safety and security and affirmation and all of those things. And, and that resulted in most of my problems, along with the stuff that I dealt with my father, who had a very erratic temper. He was a very angry man. He was, he was physically abusive with us when he would get to that level. And that was because his parents were like that to him. So, um, you know, having to deal with my dad's erratic temper growing up and not feeling safe and then dealing with the emotional abuse in a long-term marriage, not feeling safe shows a pattern there. Having to remove yourself from those situations is the, of course the first thing, but then exercise and getting your body back in order. You know, I've said on a few other of my trainings, there are three brains. You've got your brain brain, which I love to study, but then you've got your gut, which is another, is your second brain. And then you've got your third brain, which is your heart. If you're, when you're under a large amount of stress, the actual uh, microbiome in your gut is severely affected. And it has been affected um, for me as well. So getting myself into physical shape, but fixing my eating and my um, health habits was huge. You know, the next thing is you have to deal with the emotional issues. And um, for instance, going to therapy. I was in therapy for a long time, talk therapy. It was helpful to an extent, um, but then I had to kind of take it to the next level on my own. Um, there's something called the emotional freedom technique. Or if you've heard it tapping, that's something that I'd like to dive into. Um, I'm getting more and more able to teach it lately. I'm learning how to teach it. So I'm excited about that. Meditation was a huge game changer for me. A very specific type of meditation actually was even better than all the talk therapy years that I've gone to. Um, a very specific kind that, that actually blends neuroscience with Eastern meditation and together the, is a power pack combo to literally 
detoxify your brain and destimulate your parasympathetic nervous system, slow down your amygdala so that you can actually process emotions in the right way. And that was a huge game changer for a lot of the um, just accumulated stress that I was under. And of course, there's community. Community is a big part of emotional health is being a part of a healthy community of people that are affirming you and giving you those things that are basic needs that we need from the community, like affirmation, attention, love, you know, um, communication, consistency. Those are things that we have to get from other people. And that's why we you know, have to have a good community of support around us. And then finally, spiritual. Now, you don't have to be a religious person to agree that there is there are things that that this world cannot necessarily explain and there are higher there are higher states of being than we can experience tangibly and that's what i mean by spirituality now i'm a christian i 100 percent believe in god and uh, jesus christ is my savior because i have had conversations with my spiritual power but but even if if you are a buddhist i have studied buddhism i've studied hinduism i've studied um islam <laughs> I've studied Jewish Kabbalah. I've, I've, I love every religion because there is emotional and spiritual freedom to seeing a connection to a higher purpose. Even in addiction counseling, they say one of the biggest things you have to do is admit that there is a higher purpose, that there are things that are beyond your control. Because once you do, you can actually understand that you're part of a higher purpose and you're not so inwardly focused all the time and that's what spirituality does is, is it is it it allows us to just take this you know inward darkness and just open up and receive and and you know pull push our energy outward and that is what spirituality does um but one of the biggest things and this is this is this is the clincher for all of this one of the biggest tricks to healing all the accumulated trauma of our lives of you know our pasts and just to start fresh and it really is an impetus for just igniting the fire in general is forgiveness i can't even begin to explain the power of forgiving um because you know i had life isn't fair you know all all of us deal with unfair situations unfair people you know and and life will always challenge us but when we forgive we literally take our power back now i want to be very clear especially because i know that there are a lot of people whose traumas have come on the on the backs of somebody else or, or at the hands of somebody else um, these things you did not deserve and so i want to be very clear that forgiveness is not releasing them from their responsibility. It's not absolving them from their sin. It's not, a, it's not saying that what they did was right. Um, it, it's not releasing them from judgment of any kind. That is not forgiveness. It's not forgetting either, because I don't believe that we can ever truly forget that this ever happened to us or that these things ever happened to us. Forgiveness instead is, it's severing the emotional connection to that situation or person um, so that it doesn't become a trigger anymore. Forgiving is taking back our power and saying, you can't make me feel a certain way. I make me feel how I make me feel. I'm taking back your ability to make me feel something and I'm deciding how I'm gonna feel. And it's, it's also releasing though, it's releasing them from our judgment. If, whether you believe in, you know, God or karma or, you know, any of those concepts, we all know that our, what, our, what our energy puts out into the world often bounces back. We attract what we are, right? And so when we forgive, we're saying, okay, what you did was wrong, but I'm choosing to forgive you. Not because it's going to help you in any way, because honestly, it's not going to help them at all. They probably aren't even remorseful. Most likely the people that hurt us don't care that they hurt us and don't care that we don't forgive them. The truth is forgiveness is about us. It's about releasing them from our judgment and saying, it's not my responsibility to get back at you, to take my revenge at you, because I know that, that you will feel those consequences, but it won't be at my hand. 
I release you from my judgment because I need my freedom. I need to break the chain that's holding me to you because, you know, love can hold people together, but so can hate. You know, both of those are emotional bonds. And as soon as we can break that chain and that emotional connection no longer stimulates our amygdala the way it, it's not supposed to, then we can take our power back and we can turn our traumas into the very fuel for our change. The quote that I would love to leave you with today is falling down is an accident, but staying down is a choice. You know, we all have things that happen to us. And we all have things that sometimes we reap, you know, sometimes we've sown bad seeds and we reap those consequences and those can be traumatic too. But every trauma has the potential to turn into transformation because we've gone through it. I would say, don't hate your traumas. I actually have learned to not just make peace with my trauma, but to love my trauma. I actually would not go back in time if given the chance and not experience those things because what it did was they made me stronger. They made me more able to process joyful feelings. They increased my capacity for love. They, they gave me a, a world view of victory and triumph. And for those traumas, I thank them. And I love my father, have a great relationship with him now. I'm very good friends with my ex-husband. He's remarried. He's gotten himself together. I'm so proud of him. Uh, you know, we, we continue to be friends. I just want to say forgiveness was the start of all of that, but then dealing with all of the physical, emotional, and spiritual healing that came on the back of that. If you need that in your life and you would like a partner who's been through it, who can just help guide you, I would love to have a call with you. So, you know, my information's on the page there. Just set up a time I and we can chat and I can maybe share with you some of the things that helped me. That is my whole goal is to just see women free, free emotionally, physically, professionally, spiritually. That's my joy. That's what, that's what floats my boat is seeing people freed from their bondage and their trauma. So I'm going to leave you on that. Thank you for for being here with me today. And I hope you've gotten something very transformative from this because what doesn't kill us does make us stronger as long as we do the work. All right, take care guys.